Our speaker today is Dr. Jim Allman. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jim. Uh, I've known him since he was a high school kid, or a college kid for sure. 1968, when he was just a young'un, let me tell you. He's not anymore, so, yeah. And I'm not either, so. Uh, he was professor at Crichton College for 18 years before joining the DTS faculty. And since 1987, he's been a visiting lecturer in Australia, in the U Ukraine, and India, and also has conducted missions trips in those nations and in Siberia. Uh, he served as a translator for many of the Psalms in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And Dr. Allman has written articles for Life and Work Directions, directions for the Baptist uh, Sunday School Board, and his iTunes library includes volumes of classical music, one of his great passions. So would you welcome today with me, Dr. Jim Allman. I only have 33 days of music on the iTunes. Um, Dr. Kaiser, I'm distressed that you're a president emeritus. Um, the word emeritus comes from Latin, emerior, which means to rub out, to erase. <laughs> I don't know quite what that means, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, you may want to re revisit this with your institution. But <laughs> it is a delight to be here with you today, and especially to have the, uh, uh, the, those who are attending the, the Global Proclamation of Science. Uh, 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 Academy uh, with us. Thank you for uh, participating with us in our time of gathering. Um, you know, uh, all of us struggle deeply with sin. You wonder even how to function when sin has corralled you, it's overtaken you, and Sunday's coming. How do you get up? How do you deal? How do you continue with the burden of guilt, where I, I, we always say Jesus is hope, Jesus is where we turn, but how can I come back with the same sin over and over again and really expect, really be confident that there is hope? How can I stand to teach the Word of God, preach the Word of God? How can I help other people with sin in their lives when sin has conquered me in just the last days or hours. Isn't this, isn't this a hard thing that we face? And how do we, how do we face it? Um, where do you turn? And why is it that I can count on Jesus. What is there about him that makes him really reliable in these things? Because after all, God judges and condemns sin. And we do have Romans 8. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But why? Where do I turn in such times? There are lots of places, and some of you are already thinking of portions of Scripture that you might turn to, but one that kind of stunned me a few years ago as I was uh, reading and thinking about the text. Um, and I don't want you to turn right away. Uh, I'm going to give you the verses, but I want you to just wait to turn to them because I want to play with your mind. Uh, take it out and stretch it and push it and poke it and See if I can't get some kind of response from you. It's Isaiah 47, 46, 12 and 13. So don't turn there right away. I'll tell you when to turn there. Um, you will, you will, you, if you turn, you won't let me play. So I want to have some little fun with you in just a minute. Isaiah 46. Uh, God is coming to the end of what I consider a covenant lawsuit in Isaiah 41 to 48. And here he is... Uh, 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 passing sentence, as it were, on Babylon. And yet, it is for the reason he's even talking about Babylon in Isaiah is the sinfulness of Israel, uh, Judah, who must go into captivity into Babylon. Yes? 
And when I come to the end of the chapter, these last two verses of the chapter, he starts out, his address to, uh, to Judah is, Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are far off from righteousness. Behold, I bring my righteousness near, and I want to stop there. I just, uh, unfortunately, my prophet's class is getting a repetition, because uh, we just dealt with this this morning. But um, if you heard that, if God said that to you, listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are far off from righteousness, behold, I bring my righteousness near, what do you think is coming next? Judgment. When I read this the first time with understanding, I read it many times without understanding, but the first time I read it with understanding, I thought, oh goodness, what's going to come now? But we are in Isaiah 40 to 66, and that's, a, that's supposed to be hope. But in that passage still, there is judgment on Israel for their sin, and so maybe that's what's coming. Maybe that's where he's headed. Now I'd like you to turn to Isaiah 46, verses 12 and 13. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are far off from righteousness. I bring my righteousness near, it is not far off. Then what does he say? And my salvation will not delay. <laughs> For, he says, I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Righteousness in God leads him to save sinful Israel? That raises a question, in my mind at least, how? <laughs> how is God reasoning? How does he get from the sinfulness of Israel to his righteousness to saving Israel? And the answer I have, this, this, this is the only answer I have. There may be better ones, but this is the best one I've got. I, the Lord, in His providence, gave me a, an opportunity to do a doctorate in Old Testament here at Dallas Seminary. Then He sent me to Memphis, where I taught virtually every book of the Bible and systematic theology and church history and spiritual disciplines and uh, Greek. Never taught Hebrew, but Greek. Uh, so I got this, this huge background, and in teaching theology, I had taught six semesters of theology. In teaching theology, obviously, you have to at some point teach theology proper, and so you have to develop notes on the attributes. And as I was coming to each of the attributes, I did word studies. What is this word talking about? What's going on? And the best way I know to explain the righteousness of God in the Old Testament is that the righteousness of God is His complete, characteristic, complete loyalty to Himself and His covenant. And that explains how he can, in righteousness, save stubborn-hearted Israel who is far off from righteousness. Now, <laughs> how, how does that solve the problem? Well, see, if God, is only, if God is only loyal to himself in righteousness, then he might well judge and condemn and destroy. Yes? But he's also righteous. He is, he is righteous because he is loyal to his covenant. And in loyalty to his covenant, he promised. Do you remember Israel rebelling at Mount, at Mount Sinai? Yes? Do you remember Israel rebelling at Kadesh Barnea? Do you remember what God said to Moses? Get out of my way, I'll destroy these people. Make of you a great nation. Moses argues on the basis of, uh, of what? What's his response? He, you can't do that. It, you've made the covenant with Abraham. And if you destroy the tribe of Judah, you have not kept your promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes? If you destroy the, the tribe of Levi, you have not kept your promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Promises you made through Jacob. <laughs> but Aaron made the golden calf. Uh, well, no, he didn't. He said it was a miracle from God. <laughs> yes. I threw in the gold and out came this calf. It's the work of God. So, and this is the people you want to save? Why? 
because he's faithful to himself and his covenant. He's faithful to his character. God can't act out of harmony with his character. It's one of the things can't do. God can't do. I had a professor that is easy to quote, he's easy to imitate, and he was great with a one-liner. I call him my favorite professor. And he said, uh, God cannot lie, he cannot die, and he cannot deny himself. Why not? Because it's out of his character. He can only act according to his character, just like I can only act according to my character. But in his character, he can destroy the wicked. So how come I have hope even when I have sin because God's faithful to his covenant? And if he's faithful to his covenant, and if I'm standing to speak to God's people, I need his help, not just because I have sinned recently, but all the time. And I can count on him because as I have prayed a hundred times in my ministry, Lord, I'm so weak, I have nothing to say to these people. Don't leave them hungry because I'm unprepared. Don't abandon them. Minister to them. And he is faithful to himself, and he's faithful to his covenant. And some of the times that I have prayed that way, he's met with us in some of the most deep ways I've ever experienced. So where do I turn when I have to stand to preach? I have to stand to teach. I have to enter the counseling room and help people deal with their sins, and I haven't even found a way fully to deal with my own because I have a God who is faithful, whose character leads him to deal mercifully with those he is in covenant relationship with. I can count on that. Remember David, Psalm 51? What's Psalm 51 about? It's about the, the adultery and the murder, yes? David the adulterer, David the murderer, prays, Be gracious to me, O God, because of your loving kindness, because of the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. So where is hope? Well, it's obviously in the work of Christ, but why? Because the work of Christ is the expression of the very character of God. His faithfulness to himself sent Jesus to die on the cross. His faithfulness to himself made Jesus an adequate, a complete atonement for our sins. His faithfulness to himself and his covenant now applies all that to you and me because on my own, I have no right to his loyalty, but I am in Christ. And he will be faithful to Jesus when in loyalty to himself, he cannot be faithful to me. There is hope. There is a place to turn in such times. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for the character that you have. It both shocks us and overwhelms us on the one hand, but it also encourages and comforts us on the other. Father, we are so utterly incompatible with your character, and yet you have tied up your name and reputation forever with us. So, Father, remind us that our hope is never in our righteousness and certainly not in our sin. Our hope is always in you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.